Good morning from our world headquarters in New York. I'm Danny Berger. Welcome to Bloomberg Brief. Let's set your agenda. Israel strikes back at Iran, according to U.S. officials. The Iranian media appeared to downplay the severity of the incident. The Haven bid, it subsides as Brent crude briefly spikes above $90 a barrel. And Netflix crushes subscriber estimates, but warns those gains will slow. Well, it's a case of buy havens, ask questions later. The escalatory fears have flowed and ebbed. At the moment, it is an ebbing. That's really evident by the price of oil. When we get the headlines that there appear to be strikes in Iran from Israel, you immediately get the spike higher by to 90, over $90 a barrel from Brent crude. But as we get more color, we have backed off the most of the trade. We learned that apparently it seems Iran is downplaying the strikes, that they have no plans for any further strikes, according to Reuters. We're going to get more details on the ground at the, in a moment, but the Haven bid has also backed off. Treasuries at one point yields were lower by 14 basis points. We're lower by just five basis points now. Same goes for gold. The spike there also subsided. Sides, still trading at record highs. There are multiple elements fueling gold higher above $2,300. Finally, S&P futures, the grimness, the risk off, that's not going anywhere. We're down about half of 1%. We're on track for the sixth consecutive day of losses. If it holds, that would be the worst trend for the S&P since October of 2022. It didn't help that mere hours before the headlines about Iran and Israel, we had reports from Netflix, their earnings, Despite them looking really good in terms of subscriber growth, the growth maybe not continuing. That sent Netflix lower 5% pre and post market. Not to mention John Williams, who spoke earlier in the day yesterday, flowing the kite of hikes. It is clear that there is nervousness in this market. And again, really fueled by headlines suggesting that Israel has launched a retaliatory strike on Iran. That, according to two U.S. officials, Prime Minister Netanyahu spoke yesterday about how the country is committed to end the crisis. We are committed also to defeating the terrorist axis in Gaza, to freeing the hostages and also repelling the overall threat coming from Iran. These are very big tasks that require two things. The first thing it requires is determination. The second thing it requires is unity. Let's get over to Bloomberg's Jomana Bersechi, our Middle East anchor based in Dubai. So, Jomana, is this in Iran that is downplaying the attack? That's right, Danny. I think it's important to look at the context here because for most of this week, the whole world has been speculating as to what Israel's response to those unprecedented, unprecedented Iranian attacks on Israel over the weekend was going to look like. And of course, Israel's allies, including the U.S., have been urging the prime minister, Mr. Netanyahu, to exercise restraint. And yet what we saw in the early hours of this morning is that the response has actually occurred. Uh, we walked in this morning to news that there had been explosions in Isfahan, which is Iran's third largest city, but also significant because it is home to some key military bases, in addition to its a geographically a very close location to some key nuclear facilities within Iran as well. That is why initially you saw that massive risk of sentiment. There were concerns at inception that there was going to be a large or sustained damage to some of those facilities. But Iranian state official media were quick to point out that no nuclear clear uh, facilities had been harmed or damaged. Uh, and furthermore, they're very quick to downplay the incident. Uh, just to give you uh, some quotes from the Iranian local media, Tasnim, uh, they said that there are no reports of an attack from abroad on Iran's central city of Isfahan or any part of the country. Iran's own defense air units had been triggered and that, uh, they, according to, again, Iranian state official media, they succeeded in shooting down three drones. Uh, so as of yet, we have not had official commentary from senior Iranian leaders, um, but it is, I think, significant to note that this retaliation from Israel has finally come. Within uh, the Israeli government, it's also worth noting as well that they officially have not taken responsibility for this attack, but we've had a short while ago had a tweet put out by uh, the uh, National Defense Minister, Ben Gavir, with one word only. Uh, and that is the word weak. And so this is quite important because it reflects the fact that within the Israeli government, there are certain parts uh, of the government who would have liked to have seen a more hawkish response. Mm. And at the end, Danny, what we've seen is a retaliation. But some people are saying because it is so limited in terms of where Israel choose, chose to strike, uh, it is not an amplification. 
even if it's not an amplification, Jomana, it's clear that the rules of engagement have changed. This is a conflict that usually played in the shadows between Iran and Israel. Mm -hmm. It's no longer that. It's out in yeah. the open. So is there still this risk present of escalation, especially into other countries in the region? I think, and that is a, a very important point to be raising at, at, at this point in time, Danny, because uh, over the course of the last couple of years, uh, those tensions between Iran and Israel have played out via proxies, never directly. And that is why Iran's attack on Israel last weekend was so major. It was a major development in the region because they had never directly attacked uh, Israel. They'd, they'd in the past gone through uh, some of their proxies either in, the, in, in Syria or Hezbollah, again, a key Iranian uh, proxy situated in the southern parts of Lebanon. And so the concern right now is that should this uh, be amplified and uh, drawn out into a broader regional conflict, then you will get those other proxies within the region involved as well. And indeed, Hezbollah have been on high alert. Yesterday, um, Israeli officials reported that uh, more than a dozen Israeli soldiers had been killed in mm -hmm. the northern part of Israel in response to a Hezbollah attack. So keep an eye on what's happening on the southern border of Lebanon as well. Jomana, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Bloomberg's Jomana Bersechi. Okay, let's get to some of the other top stories that are trending on the terminal this morning. The tit-for-tat Middle East conflict is overshadowing, as you might expect, the Bitcoin having expected later today, which will curb new supply of the token, having historically bolstered the price of the largest digital asset. This time around, Bitcoin hit a record, record in mid-March before the event, leading to questions about whether the impact is already baked in. French cosmetics group L'Oreal is bouncing back as strength in Europe and North America offsets a slowdown in China. The company's like-for-like -like sales grew 9.4% in the first quarter, beating analyst estimates. Paramount shares rising in the pre-market, news that Sony and Apollo may team up for a bid in the company. Though the New York Times reports Paramount is still in exclusive talks with Skydance, that proposal has generated significant investor pushback. Netflix says subscriber gains will be lower this period and its revenue forecast slightly missed estimates. The company will stop reporting some quarterly subscriber numbers next quarter, what Wall Street mainly uses to analyze the company's growth. Coming up, we're going to get more on Netflix. We'll be speaking with CFRA's Ken Leon later this hour. But first, up next, after New York Fed President John Williams floated the possibility of a hike shaking markets, we're going to be speaking with Mads Peterson on the odds of it actually happening. This is Bloomberg. It's Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Now, less than a week after Iran's attack against Israel, U.S. officials say that Israel has launched a retaliatory attack after vowing to respond. However, Iran has downplayed the attack, and there's evidence that no nuclear facilities have been damaged. Joining us now to weigh geopolitical risk is Mads Peterson, CIO of Human Edge Investment Technology. Mads, at one point, we get an oil spike above $90 a barrel. We back off of that. We back off all of the haven bids. Is this a logical response, or are markets underestimating the odds of escalatory measures? Are we not fully prepared for that? I don't think we're fully prepared for escalatory measures, but I think with the Iranian response, the verbal response, I think it's a rational reaction in the sense that if the Iranians decided we would like to escalate this, well, then we will get this, the oil price going up, we will get global inflationary pressure, just as the Fed is again fumbling a little bit with their communication, and that will then lead to higher yields, as we saw early in the morning, and then it's a problem for markets. If mm. the Iranians say we don't need to it wasn't very bad, so we don't feel we need to retaliate. Well, then the situation is much more under control, as you can see here on the screen with the crude oil. Yeah. You know, half a half a dollar up on, on intraday, that's not bad. If we go above 90, it's, of course, a different story. So I think the market reaction is, is calm, I and it, it looks reasonable. If we just look at what, what havens were a bit, even though, again, they've backed off, yeah. we did have things like Treasury and Yen, two things that aren't supposed to act as havens if inflation is moving higher. I wonder what you think about the enduring nature of those two assets at, as havens, or are they simply havens in a gut punch, quickly go find something to protect you kind of moment? 
Well, you're absolutely right in that they're, they're the things you will reach out for just to have a diversified basket of payments. You might also want to buy some Swiss franc in that, in that situation. Um, I think the difference between these two assets is that the, the U.S. Treasury at this level is starting to look extremely interesting. Um, the, the whole curve looks looks good. You, it's the best, probably the best time in a decade to use U.S. government bond as a long time as a class diversification. The Japanese yen, I would be more careful with. That's more of a that's more of a knee jerk reaction, which we understand, but that's not something I would put in the portfolio to to hold on to value over the longer term. So, so I think they're very different in, in that aspect. Mads, whether whether Haven or not, are, are are you saying that bonds at the moment yields are attractive enough to jump back in? Well, maybe. I think it's the best time in probably a decade to consider a, a traditional balanced portfolio. In Europe, it's 40-60. In the U.S., it's 60-40. In the U.K., 60-40. <laughs> I think these are these are attractive levels. You get you get in future inflation times almost two in, in dollar terms and. There is a large potential for these yields if things go really wrong. Yeah. If things really go wrong, then the Fed has been ta- that talking about putting back the, the Fed put in the market. And then these asset classes could perform really nicely in a, in a, in a balanced portfolio. And that's the best situation we've had in 50 hmm. years or something like that. So they're getting more attractive, definitely. Well, the, the counter argument to that, Mads, would be that we're not done yet repricing. And you get a feel of that, for example, when you hear from New York Fed President John Williams yesterday saying that there's no rush to lower interest rates. Mads, I want you to quickly listen to what he said yesterday on his thoughts of the possibility of a hike. It's not my baseline. My expectation right now is that you know, interest rates are in a good place and eventually at some point would want to lower interest rates as the economy really gets to the 2% inflation that we're headed towards. If the data are telling us that we would need higher interest rates to achieve our goals, uh, then we would, we would obviously want to do that. So it's not my base case. Saying multiple times it's not his base case, trying to make that clear. But regardless, Mads, he has introduced hikes into the conversation. That is a bell that can't be unrung. In some regards, does that not tell you maybe we're not done pricing out cuts? Well, it definitely tells us that that what Paul said after the FOMC meeting last time, which is that maybe we're going to look at at cutting faster if the economy slows. Well, that was premature. So what they're doing is they're now they're now rolling it back and we we hope to get stability from the Fed this year, but they're still fiddling with their communication strategy and it's not they're, they're coming with too many statements to, to keep it clean and to keep it clear. What he says is obviously correct. Of course, you cannot rule it out. I would say there's a 25, 30% chance that you, you get a hike, but they should probably try to stabilize the communication around um, that they don't need to hike instead of saying, it's not my base case so many times. We know it's not his base <laughs> case. <laughs> That's like saying strawberries are nice in the summer. Yes, they definitely are. But, but couldn't you even say, Maz, maybe the reason that they're doing this is because markets rallied so much this year and are part of the reason that they can't cut as soon as they'd want to. So it's almost, in a way, undoing some of the verbal cuts that they put into the market when they started talking about it last December. Yeah, you're, again, you're right. I'm sorry we can't make a fight out of this. You're, you're absolutely right. Uh, we don't need to what, fight, what, Mads. It's okay. <laughs> it's, it's okay not to fight. Yeah, it's, it's just that they are always talking after the market. They should be talking about the economy, about what they want to do. But when they push up, when they push up the economy with their previous policy, the economy is now extremely strong. They misjudged how strong the economy would be. And then they're running after their own communication. This is the problem. The benefit of this is that the Fed has now realized how dependent the economy is on the market. So if we get a big equity correction, they will understand that it's a problem for the economy and therefore the cuts become a possibility again. Mm. So we have this nice dynamic where the bonds can be a diversification factor back again. So the good thing is that the Fed will react. The bad thing is that they like to talk a lot about how they would react, right. and that doesn't help anything. <laughs> hey, Mads, we have less than a minute, but you know I can't let you go without talking about your full bull portfolio and your dynamic portfolio. At the start of last year, you won 100% equities. You holding on to that? What's the outlook? We still have 100% equities, which in a fund means 99. We need a little bit of cash. But yes, as long until the stimulus unwinds, so as long as the spreads stay tight, we will hold on to it. But the case is looking weaker. We bought most of the equities in December, and we might have to cut maybe 20 or 40% of the equity position in the coming weeks unless things stabilize. 
All right, well, I expect a note in my inbox once you do that, Mads, and another appearance here on Bloomberg Brief. Thank you so much for joining this morning. So Enjoy much. your weekend, Mads. Mads Peterson of Human Edge Investment Technology. A quick check on bonds, which Mads says is possibly one of the best opportunities in the past decade, and we are buying this morning not as much as we were. We were down by 14 basis points on your 10-year yield, now just under five basis points. Still getting a bid for both Germany and the UK, uh, respectively three and two and a half basis points lower. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Saudi Arabia wants to compete with Dubai for international travelers with ambitions to attract as many as 70 million arrivals a year by 2030. Manis isn't here with me this morning, but he did earlier in the week speak to the kingdom's minister of tourism who told Manis Cranny more about how the current tensions could impact that goal. The Middle East uh, have been always historically uh, in, in tension. Uh, and uh, uh, we look at this uh, very serious and uh, we hope uh, it will not impact uh, it uh, no, will not impact the trade and and travel and tourism to 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 this part of the world so you've had a double digit growth year on year in the first quarter Absolutely. i'm curious then how much of that uh, has been religious tourism and how much of that has been global tourism because that's the that is the, the, the objective, isn't it? To balance, to Absolutely. rebalance. Absolutely. We, it's about 50-50 uh, uh, because we have the holy month of Ramadan yes. uh, in the first uh, part of the holy month of Ramadan in the first quarter. If I said to you, when does Saudi tourism become an investable asset, what is a reasonable answer to that? We are delivering. A realistic, yeah. a realistic answer. Oh, that, we, we are delivering uh, uh, visitors. Uh, uh, the market is attractive. I'll be honest with you, uh, Saudi Arabia used to rely completely on religious tourism. And since we launched the tourism visa back in 2019, mm -hmm. we started to receive uh, tourists for other purposes. And last year, we had like 14, 15 million coming to explore Saudi Arabia and to sit and stay in new hotels and to experience new experiences. How important is Riyadh Air to that ambition? I mean, it's the new airline, the planes are oh. ordered. Yep. I, I mean, Tony yep. Douglas is, yeah. is there. Is that going to be the turnkey? Because that's what it was for Dubai. Yeah, absolutely. If, if we think about Emirates, Dubai, and here we are, Riyadh Air with Saudi. Uh, Riyadh Air will be a fundamental to uh, support uh, achieving the uh, tourism ambitious, uh, ambitions, and therefore it is very important for us. He's ordering planes, uh, but at the same time we have a program called Air Connectivity Program, where we uh, provide incentives to uh, other carriers to fly direct flights to, to uh, the different Saudi cities. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, starting from uh, uh, China Airlines, uh, some European airlines, Wizz Air started to fly to Saudi Arabia three, four years ago, and many other airlines on the queue to make sure that we will carry the 70 million that we are targeting to, to bring to Saudi Arabia by 2030. The next question you have been asked 50 different ways. There's an obsession in the West with alcohol. There's an obsession with can I get a glass of wine? Can I have a glass of wine with my dinner? My question to you is, does it change the dial for tourism? Do you think delivering alcohol in Saudi Arabia would materially change the numbers for tourism? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you something. Uh, so far, we have not faced challenges. I completely agree with you. Alcohol is important, but we decided not to, to offer it. And so far, uh, uh, people are coming, exploring Saudi Arabia, coming for business, coming for leisure, coming for tr uh, religious reasons, and they have not complained. They are enjoying other offerings like the food, the retail, the hosp Saudi hospitality, the culture, and, and, and it, uh, I hope it will continue to the, to, to the, with this, you know. That was Saudi Arabia's Minister of Tourism speaking to Manis Cranny. Some breaking lines now coming from Iran state media saying that the attempted Israeli drone attack failed. This is a somewhat of a shift in tone because previously the state media had said that, uh, that yes, 
that there had been strikes, but no reports of foreign attack against Israel. That was the word overnight, but now they are saying that the attempted Israeli drone attack failed. It's quite a different message than what we're getting from the Israeli state media, or Israeli media, rather. The Jerusalem Post saying that the attack sends a message to Iran that it, quote, could do worse. We've also heard from Israelis Ben Gavir suggesting that the response, that the attack on Iran was, quote, weak. At the same time, some more breaking lines from the journal Biden now weighing over $1 billion in new arms for Israel. So this is a developing story. We'll keep you on it. But for at the moment, the reporting suggests from Reuters that Iran has no plans to retaliate. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Here's what you need to know. Israel strikes back at Iran, according to U.S. officials, though Iranian media appear to downplay the severity of the incident. The Haven bid subsides as Brent crude briefly spikes above $90 a barrel. And Netflix crushes subscriber estimates but warns those gains will slow. The latest line out of the Iran state media saying that the attempted Israeli drone attack failed. Again, this is part of the language that's being used that seems to suggest that Iran is downplaying this attack. Reuters also reporting earlier in the morning that they have no plans for retaliation. That's why the price action looks as such. A spike above $90 a barrel when we initially get reports that there were drone strikes above Iran, Iran media reporting them too, but again saying that they successfully thwarted them. Then you also get reports that no nuclear sites were hit in Iran either. And then we go to barely change on the price of Brent crude. The same happens across asset classes. Yes, there is still a bid coming in for treasuries, uh, at, but at the moment, the dollar is basically flat. Euro versus the dollar, that is also little change this morning, too. Treasuries at the moment, yields are still moving lower, but we're just talking to Mads Peterson over at Human Edge Investment, who basically said this is potentially one of the best opportunities in a decade for yields. Haven bid or not, yields are high enough and they are juicy at the moment. And there's Brent crude uh, up six tenths of one percent. I'm not sure if we have stocks, but stocks at the moment still trending lower this morning. Equities on track for their sixth consecutive day of losses. And if it does that, it would be the worst streak of losses since October 2022. One stock that we are keeping an eye on, it is Netflix. Shares are extending declines in the pre-market trade, even though the streamer service crushed the street's estimates for subscriber gains. Why the declines then? Why down six and a third percent? Analysts are concerned that the firm's decision to stop reporting paid quarterly membership and revenue per subscriber might mean it's shifting the focus to something else, specifically sales and profit. We're not going to be silent on members as well. We'll periodically update uh, when we grow and we hit certain major milestones. We'll announce those. It's just not going to be part of our regular reporting. And we want to do all of this thoughtfully and give everyone time to adjust this transition. So we're going to continue to report subscribers until Q1 of next year. Joining us now is Ken Leon, Director of Equity Research at CFRA. He has a price target of $650 and a buy rating on Netflix. Ken, great to see you this morning. Thanks for joining. So Netflix is one of the top performers in the S&P this year. It's added $112 billion, this alone, 13% away from its all-time high. Was this an earnings report that just didn't justify the price? Well, it's great to be with you. So uh, results were fine, and even the outlook for this year 13 to 15% guided revenue growth. We're talking about $38, $39 billion of revenue. Uh, operating margins, 26, 28% range. Uh, so that's the fundamentals. But I think for uh, investors and in their uh, investment committees are going to be thinking about, is this because of the size of the company becoming entering a more mature stage where growth might be an issue? Um, that's the problem on valuation. I think uh, when we look at Netflix, it's hard really to put a conventional valuation of price to earnings, so we use uh, different metrics. Um, what it suggests is that companies go through life cycles, and I think the stock is down today because everyone is trying to calibrate um, if this is a slightly slower company or a company where you have to value on something called GARP, growth at a reasonable price. Ken, what's your so, take? Which is it? I, I think we're moving into the second stage of just maturity because unfortunately, 
unlike a Microsoft or anyone that benefits from AI, we just don't have that with video streaming. This is a high quality company for growth, but again, uh, it's entering a stage where uh, the numbers just don't grow to the sky. Well, to that point, if we look at where they've squeezed growth from in the past year, it was a password crackdown, and then it was this ad-supported platform or ad-supported level of paid subscription for Netflix. Does Netflix just not have any of those levers left to really ramp up growth again? Well, they do, but they're they're almost you know finite numbers. They're not numbers that go to infinite like AI. So it it again hurts the future years of of valuing a company, uh, mostly because uh, the growth rates are going to be smaller. Um, it doesn't take away from Netflix leadership the pivot from linear to video streaming. Uh, video, video streaming now gained 200 basis points to 38% market share. Uh, in the earnings release, Netflix has about 8 or 9% market share. It's just you just can't move the numbers to the sky. The competition is also here, and it is real, Ken. Walt Disney, Paramount+, Plus, Hulu, Apple TV. Does Netflix come out the winner of all of that? It is at the moment, but can it hold on to it? Well, Netflix really looks to be the, the, the leader and certainly does things to enhance uh, member retention and getting them delighted so that they retain subscription. Um, and I think the other issue is, which bothers uh, analysts, is that the penetration rate I mentioned is still low, yet the management doesn't have the confidence to give you disclosure on subscriber numbers, uh, given that they can capture that anywhere in the world uh, on a sizable customer base today, but much bigger opportunity. So, I mean, that's what perplexes investors. Hmm. I mean, part of what they're doing to, to retain the customers is leaning more into sports. We heard about their partnership with WE Raw. On the other side of, Ken, uh, of things, Ken, not that we've heard much of it since it was announced, but there was the sports streaming partnership coming, or venture rather, coming from ESPN, Fox, Warner Bros. Discovery. We still are waiting to hear what the contour is, even what the name of that will look like. But does that put Netflix at a significant disadvantage to not be a part of whatever this thing is? So uh, all the entertainment companies in video or music, but video are, are looking to capture people's time. And that extends from just um, video entertainment to sporting, sports or even gaming or, and gambling. And, and I think when you put that all together, Netflix has been very thoughtful. They have a, a billion dollar multi-year contract uh, with WWE, Worldwide Wrestling Enterprises. Um, it's looking mostly to keep uh, customers on their, uh, on, on their viewing, mostly with sports documentaries. So it, it's kind of an interesting dynamic one, I think, that they have a pretty good handle on. Uh, we're, we're just perplexed. Why wouldn't you give subscriber numbers? Um, hmm. You know. I, you know, that's the real issue. Yeah, okay, let, let, let's just stick with that then. If it is the real issue, one of the theories, as you say, Ken, is just that this is this is a maturing company. It wants to kind of say, look, it's more about sales and profit. W what else could the other options be? Is it just that they expect it to be so bad they don't want it out there in the open anymore? Yeah, so, so they have just under 297 million subscribers or what they call members. Um, it's widely distributed, not just uh, the Americas uh, at 83 million, but 92 million in Europe, uh, 48 million in Latin America, and 48 million in Asia. I still think there's room for opportunity to my point about penetration of the market and this tsunami shift from linear to streaming. Um, I, I, I just think they're, they're just a little less confident um, and uh, don't want to surprise on the downside. But you can see the stock is down overnight right. because the analysts are saying maybe this is a more mature company. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of these things that in, in trying to perhaps protect themselves, they af actually inflict injury, at least in the medium term. I, I guess that's the question, Ken. How long does this injury continue? If they continue, again, as they plan, starting in the first quarter of 2025, to not report these subscriber num numbers, is it something that the market is continuously going to be saying, hey, sales and profit, that looks nice, but at the end of the day, we want to hear how many quote-unquote members you got? 
I think they're going to course correct the two CEO. I mean, this is a very good management, but you go back in time, well over 10 years ago, there, there have been stumblings when you make um, kind of mess, you know, when they make a decision what they want to communicate to investors, Reed Hastings, the founder, and then they, they, they made the adjustment again. So I think it's one of those situations where there's nothing wrong with the business itself, the op opportunity or what investors call the TAM, total addressable market, the low penetration rate, uh, best in class, you know, Disney, uh, you know, bring them all on, whether mm. it's uh, YouTube or TikTok. You know, Netflix is a superb franchise, uh, but I think they tripped over their feet today. Right. Well, I'll tell you what, Ken, I plan to spend this weekend watching Three Body Problem. Take, the, take that as you will. Ken, thank you so much for your time. Ken Leon of CFRA. Okay, just to recap some of the most recent lines we have learned over the Iran and Israel conflict, one of them being that Biden, according to the Wall Street Journal, is weighing over $1 billion in new weapons deals for Israel. To be sure, a deal would be a drawn-out process by Congress. However, this comes off the bat of other foreign aid that Congress is attempting to pass. The other headline breaking over the recent minutes, Iran state media saying that an attempted Israeli drone attack failed. This is the first time that Iran has acknowledged that the drone attack, which again some media is reporting are missiles, not drones, but the first time that Iran is saying that it is indeed coming from Israel. The Israelis themselves maintain an official silence on the attack. However, there are some officials saying, quoting things like, quote, weak, that perhaps the attack wasn't enough. But again, Iran acknowledging for the first time that this has come from Israel. More to come here on Bloomberg. watching Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger in New York. Now, the Biden administration is said to be weighing more than a billion dollars in new arms for Israel. That, according to a report from The Wall Street Journal, the weapons deal would include tank ammunition, military vehicles and mortar rounds. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Oliver Crook for more. Oliver, I know the team and Bloomberg is out for out to the White House to confirm this. But what does it look like this package, this deal for Israeli aid would look like and how difficult will it be to actually get it through Congress? Yeah, let's look through the sort of the different parts that we've seen from the Wall Street Journal. So we understand this is more than a billion dollars that is being suggested from the White House here. The first 700 million would go to tank ammunition, about 500 million tactical vehicles, and just under 100 million on mortar rounds. And that is in addition, Danny, critically to that House bill that is now going to potentially be voted on as early as tomorrow that Mike Johnson is putting um, on the floor of the House that has been stalled, that has all that extra aid, yes, to Israel, but also to Ukraine, to Gaza, to the Indo-Pacific, that we might get some motion on. And what's important and what's significant about this other deal, over a billion dollars worth of it, is that it's among one of the largest transfers, a uh, sales, I should say, of American weapons to Israel since the beginning of the war. And it is one of the first new deals, right? A lot of the stuff that has been transferred to Israel are pre-existing um, contracts that have already been set up with Israel to the tune of uh, $25 uh, billion. And this is where it gets sort of um, complicated because, of course, there has been a lot of criticism, even from the White House and the United States, of Benjamin Netanyahu and how he's conducting the war. It seems that they're willing to push forward. The question is, will Democrats and others within the U.S. government be, willing, be as willing to push this through? And along with that, you, you mentioned, Ollie, that we're also going to have this other package for foreign aid. Um, I mean, this is one that had been held up, but Mike Johnson really seems bent on getting this through, despite those opposing him on more to the right, saying that this would be a reason to oust him. But he's pushing ahead with it. What are the contours of this? Yeah, so this is a really interesting sort of turn. Um, obviously, this has been stuck in the House for about six months and really held up by the Freedom Caucus and everything that had to do with how um, the speakership had been set up under Kevin McCarthy. And now you have Mike Johnson saying, basically, he needs he says that you need to put this forward. You need to let the House vote their conscience on this bill. For him, he sees the issues of China, of um, Iran, and of Russia as all connected. He's called it a new sort of axis of evil. So he says that we need to sort of, the United States needs to be able to vote on this. So this is going 
going to contain, contain the Ukraine aid, $61 billion, but it will also now, we understand, have an expanded role of including more sanctions on Iranian crude. There is a question about how effective that can be, right? There mm -hmm. are already a huge number of sanctions on Iranian crude. So, so this is going to sort of target some of the ship-to-ship -ship transfers we have. But what I found interesting is also some of the secondary sanction transactions between Chinese financial institutions and sanctioned Iranian banks that, you, that are used to purchase oil. Remember, about 80 percent of the oil that comes out of Iran, about 1.5 million uh, barrels a day, goes into China and is refined there by independent producers. Yeah, I mean, it's a good point because Iran exports more, as exporting at the moment, Oliver, more oil than any time over the past six years. It really is the art of circumvention, which they've nailed. So, again, how can the U.S. have an impact? It's, it's probably by going to China. Oliver, thank you so much. Oliver Crook there on the latest from the House. Now, as we await House votes on additional aid for Ukraine, defense spending by NATO members has also been in focus. The IMF is, of course, taking place in D.C., and during which I caught up with the Greek finance minister, Kostya. Hatsidakis, who again is in Washington for the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings. We had an interesting uh, meeting with Secretary Yellen some months ago uh, in, uh, in Brussels in the Eurogroup meeting. We exchanged views and we have a good uh, uh, cooperation. Uh, we have to focus our efforts on Europe on the policies we implement in Europe, I think the key word for us is competitiveness, regardless of the policies adopted here uh, in, in Washington, uh, D.C. Uh, now there are some very interesting reports uh, in, in Brussels focusing exactly on this issue, uh, single market, uh, competitiveness of, of Europe. and. Uh, we try to have a constructive role in adapting the European policy to the new realities. Certainly, as far as Europe is concerned, we have to be uh, more competitive uh, in the near future. In terms of another conversation that's very present in a U.S. election year is defense spending. Greece is one of the countries that has surpassed the 2 percent goal set by NATO, something Trump has been very critical of other NATO members not matching. We are in the midst of now two hot wars popping up in only the past few years. Are those criticisms, do they have a point, Minister? Do other NATO countries need to start spending more on defense? Yeah. You see, uh, as you may know, we spent 3% uh, 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 in uh, defense expenditure. Uh, we are uh, th the second country uh, as regards ranking in the, uh, in the, the, NATO, uh, the European NATO countries after Poland. Uh, so uh, we, we uh, have met the criteria set, and I think that all the member states should uh, comply with the rules. Uh, this is uh, uh, the reason why we have an alliance. There are rules and we have to comply with the rules. This is, this is our message and it is very simple. What, what is the risk of non-compliance, Minister? We uh, take seriously our experience uh, in the past. Uh, our country uh, didn't comply with the rules of the European Union at the time, the Monetary Union. We were living beyond our means, uh, and we paid for that. I think the reason why we have these alliances, uh, be it the European Union or NATO, is uh, for those alliances to have an added value. Uh, and in order for, uh, to, to, uh, to, for them to have the added value, the member states should uh, follow the rules. It, mm. is very, it is very simple. And I right. think that given the turbulent period of time we are living, uh, Russians' aggression uh, in Ukraine and so on, uh, I think that uh, uh, all the member states are getting this message. Uh, and I think that uh, all the member states will do their part. This is what I wish, at least. Minister, we're, we're almost out of time, but before I let you go, I, I mentioned that a lot of the galvanizing of this mention had come from Trump. Do you think Europe is ready if there is a Trump 2.0? The American people will decide. Uh, will not dictate 
we cannot dictate. Of course, what but, but the you Americans think your, Europe will, will be ready for that? I refer, I refer to the Europeans. <laughs> uh, uh, will respect the decision of the American voters and will try to cooperate with the other side of the Atlantic. I believe, and I firmly believe, really, that uh, uh, taking into account international turbulences, both the European Union and the United States are condemned, I would say, to cooperate. Uh, it wouldn't be a wise decision to ignore the uh, modern challenges and proceed alone. Of course, there are different interests. Uh, I don't underestimate this aspect. But on the other hand, uh, we have a lot in common, the same principles, and to some extent, to some extent, the same interests. Mm. So we have to cooperate, and I think that uh, we'll achieve this objective. The Greek finance minister saying you should follow the rules, speaking with me yesterday from the IMF meetings in Washington. A quick check on your haven currencies this morning. The Swiss franc clearly has come out the winner in all of this, but most of the gains they have backed off, as it does seem that the response from Iran is limited. We're down about half a percent on dollar versus the Swissy. We also get some backing off of the higher pricing in the yen, but come on, would that could that really last given the macro environment, given the rate differentials, dollar now essentially flat again. Again, the latest lines coming from Iranian state media, they are acknowledging that it is indeed Israel. They are saying it is drone strikes and that they failed. Of course, media reports from Israel say that the attack involved missiles. The official line from Israel so far is one of non-acknowledgement. Coming up, we're going to take a look at some of the market moving events for you to watch out throughout the day here on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Brief. I'm Danny Berger in New York. Let's get you set up now for your trading day with a look at what's ahead. American Express will be reporting its earnings before the bell. Then Chicago Fed President Austin Goolsbee participates in moderating a Q&A at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. India's elections then begin with Prime Minister Modi seeking a third term with over 900 million people eligible to vote. Now, it's moving in the pre-market. Netflix is falling as its second quarter revenue forecast was a slight disappointment, but it absolutely crushed subscriber expectations. But soon they're not going to report subscriber growth anymore. Paramount shares, those are jumping. Apollo and Sony are said to be considering a joint offer for the media company, up some 10.2%. Coinbase also rising as Bitcoin rebounds from its losses. We're getting the Bitcoin halving over the weekend. But some of the Bitcoin bid coming in with a bid for the rest of Havens, which is subsiding. Stocks, though, are still lower. We're on track for our sixth consecutive day of losses for this U.S. equity market. Should it hold, it would be the worst since October 2022. We're still monitoring the lines of Iran and Israel. We'll have that for you on surveillance, which is up next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.